And here we go. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Karen Sieber. Uh, our guest today, Karen is a humanities specialist at the Clem and Linda McGillicuddy Humanity Center at the University of Maine. And we are, we've, we've spent some time preparing for this. So I want to get her slides up uh, right now and share that with you. And does this look right, Karen? It does, yes. All right. Um, very good, very good, okay. Okay, well, um, I am pleased to, uh, to invite our audience to listen in and ask questions about this presentation. I, I want to give you a heads up that some of the material and at least one of the images that we're going to show are disturbing. So this content might not be for everyone, but we've spent some time in our circles at the Mount Desert Island Historical Society talking about racism and the we featured a Chewbacca chats on the Ku Klux Klan and what I've learned in working with Karen over the last week is uh, uh, disabused me of a notion that racial violence was not present in the early 20th century in Maine, that uh, the Klan's activities and racial activity took a different form. But what she's uncovered uh, reveals a situation that's very different. So I invite you to, um, to listen in and uh, hear the what the work of a historian such as Karen can can reveal about our world. Uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. So uh, Karen, let's um, let's get started with your talking to us about how you first got involved in this research. Yeah, well, I actually, like you, didn't uh, start as a historian. I worked for 15 years in retail management and nonprofit management. And so, uh, when I went back to school in my 30s, everything felt new to me, where I constantly was like, why was I never taught this? And so I, at the time, I had been working with a museum in Durham, North Carolina, um, helping design a museum exhibit um, on the bottom left-hand corner there of mm -hmm. the community of Haytai, which was largely destroyed during urban renewal. So I'd already been kind of doing community outreach, community archives. Uh, the picture in the top left and bottom right corners um, is with some work that I was doing with the Cotton Mill Village in Gastonia, North Carolina, that was going through kind of some a mixed use revitalization. Uh, so I was working with the community there to track the histories of the workers that lived in the village um, and building a community archive of the things that they had collected over the years, but also using historic records. And so I ended up tracking every mill village resident that lived in this town in the 1920s, which is the map here, um, and all of the census data that went along with them. And so I started thinking a lot about how I could use data in other ways as a historian. Um, and so, you know, it's one thing to say a neighborhood is segregated, but to take actual data from the time period and be able to map it and show how white workers and black workers were very much segregated living in the neighborhood. So I was trying to think of other ways that I could use these kinds of skills. You know, I came from a background in business and so spreadsheets are, you know, something that, that I take, you know, great pride in creating a great spreadsheet. And so I happened to be at the time researching the intersection of kind of travel and education in the South um, and was doing that myself through a road trip and was going to, you know, going to Clarksdale to the crossroads, you know, the, the center of blues history or um, exploring food culture and that kind of thing. So I was in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, the picture of me and the monster truck is actually just a mere few hours before I first heard about the Red Summer myself. I was in Knoxville at the time, uh, staying in an Airbnb was researching uh, the history of the neighborhood that I was staying in and discovered that there was a race riot there in 1919. 
And as one does when you're on vacation and you're on the street and you see a little information panel or, or something, you, you Google and you go to, to Wikipedia while not you know, the most reliable source, uh, discovered that this was a nationwide series of events, that Knoxville was not the only location, but Chicago, my hometown, had one of the most violent um, incidents that summer. Well, and here you're, you're teaching me, uh, what, what was the Red Summer? Yeah, the Red Summer, the term was first coined by uh, James Weldon Johnson, uh, the African-American leader and activist. Um, it's a lot of people think that it's associated with communism um, or with that movement and the Red Scare, but it's actually um, the red is in relation to blood. So this is a term that he came up with to describe, there's a series of events from, we call it the Red Summer, but it's roughly April through late October, early November of 1919, uh, nationwide wave of violence. This happened coast to coast, rural areas and urban areas. Um, this, you know, it included everything from lynchings and race riots to, you know, entire populations of black towns forcibly um, pushed out, black churches burned to the ground, businesses destroyed, attacks on people in the streets. Um, so this was you know, if you can imagine, almost as you would today, every day opening the newspaper, it's a new event. It's a new, a new protest. It's a new injustice. Um, and so this, initially, we kind of knew there was two or three dozen. But um, now with my research, I think we're up to four dozen cities across the United States that this happened in um, that summer. And after learning about these events, you ended up building what, building what you call a rogue archive of material. Can you talk about that process and um, uh, what that is? Yeah, so if I were to want to create a traditional archive um, within an academic institution or a library, um, and I wanted to collect information from 25 institutions across the country, this would take years of planning, likely hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know, an unbelievable, unbelievable amount of, um, you know, meetings and legwork and grant proposals. But having worked in um, community archives and seeing the capabilities of the digital in being able to quickly get information out there, um, you know, there was no reason why information about the Red Summer was not publicly available. There's this short Wikipedia page that existed in 2015. There's a book that was written in the late 60s and then a handful of other texts on individualist cities. But none of the institutions, even the largest ones, weren't making this material available. But there is no reason why they shouldn't have been. Um, copyright restrictions as they are, the cutoff was 1923. And so all of this material was created before the copyright restrictions and therefore there is nothing legally preventing me from just going around collecting the material myself, digitizing it and making it available to the public. And so in 2015, I took a road trip around the country, visited 25 different um, historical societies, libraries, other repositories, uh, and collected everything that I could find about these riots. Um, this isn't the exact route that I ended up taking. I took three different loops. So one up the mid-Atlantic, uh, one throughout the South, and then one throughout the Midwest and, and Plain States. Did you do this as an independent scholar or were you affiliated with a, a history program? Yeah, um, at the time I was at UNC. Um, I had a $3,000 grant that I received to do this, um, which paid for quite a lot of this. Um, my parents, who very well might be listening right now, kicked in a little bit of gas money on the side. Friends, death. friends and former colleagues from across the country, um, you know, let me stay on couches. I did a lot of camping, um, but really did this as, as efficiently as possible. But for a little bit of gas money and you know, food, the occasional flash drive, or every once in a while there's a feed, a download, 
one of the images from the institution, but, but really for a few thousand dollars, I was able to create this thing that not only includes an archive, but there's um, interactive maps and timelines and um, you know, a lot of bang for, for my buck. <laughs> well, this, this reminds me a little bit of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society's history harvest, where we invite people in to show us artifacts and we keep a digital record of that oral history and of the materials. And it sounds like you took history harvest on the road, focused on this singular topic of the Red Summer. So what kind of material were you able to find? Really a little bit of everything. You know, without a doubt, the bulk of it is news clippings from across the country. Um, so even when there are like, you know, there's a hole in the governmental records, there's generally a newspaper report of it somewhere. But I went through um, meeting minutes from places like um, the Union League or uh, the NAACP. I went through coroner's reports. I have photographs, telegrams, um, poetry, a little bit of everything. Um, so depending on what a scholar's interests are, there's ways of filtering the archives. So if you're into political cartoons, you can look at just that. If you're um, if you're a legal scholar, you can look at court court documents and um, and records from from the jail and testimonies and things. So this looks like kind of a uh, dark journey in the sense of the material you encountered is pretty disturbing stuff. Is it, what kind of um, emotional effect did it have on you? We, we didn't plan this question, but I'm really curious about it. What, how did this affect you encountering this material? Yeah, and you have to keep in mind that I did all 7,500 miles and collected all of this material in a three or four month period. Um, so this was every day, all day, going through material about lynchings and um, looking at photographs of bodies on fire and oh, uh, yeah. and seeing time and time again, the perpetrators not, not being held accountable. Um, when I was traveling to do this, this was, um, you know, within a year after um, Trayvon Martin, um, Tamir Rice, you know, had just happened. I was in Charleston collecting material when Bree Newson was climbing the flagpole, um, and you know, which was just sh shortly a few weeks after the um, the church shooting there in Charleston. So, you know, it felt especially timely. Um, I was so frustrated that not only did I know not know about this, but you know, even these places that I was visiting where it actually occurred, with the exception of a handful of places, those actual towns, you know, if you asked most people walking down the street if they knew that there was a violent massacre of hundreds of people there, you know, the answer is generally no. So, yeah. um, you know, well, I was that others would, would be as infuriated as, as I was. So you, we showed a map of your travels uh, that didn't include Maine, but somehow we're not off the hook. So you've, you've come across an episode of violence that does apply to, uh, to Maine. Tell us about that. Yeah, so these are a handful of other, other things that I collected oh. here. I'm, I'm just going to mention them briefly because I think- Yeah, go ahead and describe what we're looking at. Um, on the left is a letter written from Death Row. There was a man named Maurice Mays who was put on trial for uh, an act that there was increasingly evidence that he did not commit. Um, so this is his letter from, um, from death row to the governor pleading for his release. Um, this event was what spurred the events in Knoxville. Um, <clears throat> the event, the image on the right is from a union that sharecroppers organized um, to help them just get better pay for, for their work and for their output. Um, because of that organization of their labor, um, all black residents in this area were rounded up. Hundreds were shot. Others were corralled and put into train cars. Um, so, I mean, um, in Arkansas, especially, the the violence was uh, quite disturbing. And so, yeah, you kind of think that New England and especially Maine is immune to this. Um, we do know that the KKK, for the most part, had changed their tactic. That is right. Um, their focus really was more on immigrants at this time, but it wasn't like <laughs> that wasn't, you know, that was not their only focus. Um, 
I don't know if there's a direct connection here to the KKK, but so as I'm on the road in 2015, um, certain institutions were real gold mines where I would come upon, you know, 75 or 100 documents in one sitting and I would have only, you know, a day to go through it. Um, and so I vaguely remember coming across this article about a riot in Maine. I, at the time, I didn't have a lot of time to sit through and read articles. I was making sure it was Red Summer related and I was clipping it and moving on. Yeah. And so I remember bookmarking this and thinking no one's ever included Maine in Red Summer violence data before. Um, and I clipped it into the wrong subfolder on a flash drive. And years later, I now work at the University of Maine, uh, found this item on a flash drive while looking for something else. And then it just got me digging into the story further. Um, was, you know, are there other documents about this event that, that I could track down? You know, is this indeed something that we could consider to be Red Summer violence? So I want to warn our audience that the next image we're going to show you is uh, very disturbing. So if, you, if it's not your, you don't, you feel like it might be uh, too hard to handle, turn away. Um, tell us what we're about the incident that occurred in Orono during the red summer of 1919. Yep, so pictured here are uh, Samuel and Roger Courtney. They were two brothers from Boston, two African-American brothers. Um, census records would classify them as mulatto. Um, they were very light-skinned. Um, in late April of 1919, they were attacked in their dorm room at two in the morning by a group of 60 or 70 freshmen. Um, they were able to escape, but three of the freshmen were knocked out in their escape, uh, which then kind of infuriated the crowd. It grew to a manhunt of numerous hundreds of people um, that split into three different mobs, one going to, through Orono looking for the two boys, one going to Old Town and one to Bangor. Um, they found the boys in Old Town ended up taking livestock harnesses, almost like a, you know, rain in a, in a bit um, around their heads, were led back to campus four miles by the mob uh, and were brought to the livestock viewing pavilion on campus, which if people today are familiar with the Cyrus Pavilion, um, this is the former livestock pavilion where they would have livestock shows. And so they brought the brothers back to this pavilion in front of a crowd of then hundreds of people, uh, forced them to declothe. Um, the brothers had to slop each other with hot molasses. And then the crowd took um, what we're assuming to be feathers from dorm room pillows. I mean, as it is, you know, four or five in the morning at this point, um, and tarred and feathered these two brothers in front of the crowd. None of the perpetrators were ever uh, punished. In fact, the two brothers themselves were asked to leave the university. Um, the event was kept out of the university newspaper, university records, Bangor Daily News never reported on it, Portland Press Herald. But thankfully, there's a handful of records that do exist. Um, so I, building off of the first discovery at the Tuskegee Institute, um, which had some incorrect information, um, a wrong spelling of, of the two boys, um, of their last name, and, but was able to use that information to then go back through census records and yearbooks and track down more about who these boys were um, and validate this story through other records, primarily from African-American newspapers. Um, their father, who is pictured in the bottom right here, was a very well-known African-American physician in Boston. He was like the head of the National Medical Association, the Negro Business League. He was buddy-buddy with Booker T. Washington. And so while it may not have interested Mainers or been in the news here in Boston, and especially within Boston's Black community and with the larger Black community nationwide, people were paying attention to this story. Um, and, um, oh, and I'll mention briefly, if you, if you want to go back for just a moment, yeah, this yeah. picture, um, I didn't get to that point. Um, 
very much in debt to the librarians at the Special Collections at Fogler Library. Um, when I talked to them about my research, uh, one of them recalled seeing at some point in time a picture of two boys tarred and feathered in an old scrapbook. Um, and so they were able to help with the information that I had um, to now have this image. And for the Red Summer as a whole, there's really only a handful of images that exist of the violence. And they're primarily in Chicago and Omaha, two of the largest events that summer. And so um, to have a historic record of this to back up the media reports is, is just fascinating. So, okay to move on here? Yeah. So how, um... Oh, I have so many questions about it. What, what <laughs> the boys appear to be, the boys in the background appear to be wearing kind of a, a particular sort of hat, uh, maybe a beanie or something. Mm -hmm. um, what's the, was there any fraternity association with this or what, what, what united the perpetrators? I've been trying to determine uh, just that. We know that the initial people um, to kind of rile up the others were freshmen. Um, there are, so we do know that, so I'll mention there's a third Courtney brother, Horace. Um, all three brothers attended school at the same time. So at least two of the three brothers served in World War I. Um, Roger and Horace both played football on UMaine's football team. They sang in Glee Club. They were popular. They were handsome. The ladies loved them. And a lot of this really rubbed people the wrong way. Um, these are the things that all instigated violence in other cities across America. African-American soldiers returning home from war um, were repeatedly attacked that summer, often by white soldiers themselves. Um, there's a good quarter of the attacks of the Red Summer that year were spurred by um, by angry white men, angry that uh, an African-American had dated a white woman. And these two Courtney brothers were both known to be quite popular with the ladies. And so I think there's a number of possible instigating factors. Um, yeah. I've heard mention in a few places they were kind of arrogant, but they are rich, well-educated, handsome, athletic, boys, you can see why. I mean, this is a lot of this really kind of goes against what people wanted to believe about African Americans and the capabilities of people. And so for these men to be to be very proud and um, you know, I think because of their skin, they often passed in society. Um, it was definitely known at UMaine that they were African American, but you know, I think that despite um, their place in society, it didn't prevent this kind of violence from occurring? Um. Well, the president of the university, uh, Joan Farini Mundy, has uh, reacted, I, I think, directly to your work, right? So tell us about this, this statement. Yep. Yeah, in the longer statement, um, it talks a little bit about, about my discovery and, and why this is important. You know, I think for those that, that aren't keeping track of what's going on on UMaine's campus, we're in the process of considering a building renaming of Little Hall right now, which is named after a famous eugenicist. Uh, and so, and we've recently renamed buildings um, after uh, Penobscot names. And so the president and the university for the past couple of years have already really been doing some, some great work on kind of recognizing um, difficult histories and voices that are hidden. And so, I'll mention that 100 years prior, the university president at the time, uh, President Ailey, responded by blaming the victims and uh, letting off the perpetrators. So I'm gonna read for you President Farini Mundy's statement, which, um, which I think could not have been more perfect. We should all be alarmed by how such ab abhorrent local violence resonates not just with similar and widespread events in the past, but also with recent events in contemporary America. There is much in Humane's past for which we can all be truly proud, but we cannot shy away from confronting and atoning for our university's more painful moments. Well, this is certainly uh, one of the more painful moments that I've encountered. And, uh, and you are continuing your work to 
explore uh, hidden histories on uh, the university's campus and working directly with students, which also echoes the kind of thing we're trying to accomplish here at the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. Can you, um, can you tell us about this project uh, you've titled Hidden Histories? Yeah. Um, so because I come from a background in public history and digital humanities, I'm always really interested of how we can share our research as scholars, whether students or, or faculty, um, how we can share that research with the public and engage the public in new and different ways. Um, and so, you know, after learning about this myself and walking past these spaces on campus where they were attacked, you know, and I see all of the students going by and no one really has any idea of what really occurred there. So I'm very fortunate that uh, Professor Liam Reardon, who I believe has spoken uh, at the Historical Society in the past, sure. uh, he's teaching a public history class this semester. Uh, and so I'm working with a handful of students in his class <laughs> to design a virtual walking tour of these hidden histories of campus. And so the Courtney Brothers incident will be one of them, but we're also looking at a queer history of campus or um, students who fought during World War I, the first female faculty member, a protest against Vietnam. You know, I think there's a lot of stories that don't really get told. We have these big important men and their names on buildings and, and you kind of, and everything is kind of celebratory and, it, and it's understandable why. And there's a lot to celebrate as, as the president said, there's a lot to celebrate on campus, but, um, but we're training the next generation of learners to be critical thinkers. And so to be able to get the students to think about campus as not just a place where history is made, but, or not just a place where history is studied, but where history has been made and forgotten and pushed aside. And so, you know, I think I want to get them to think about, um, to use the campus kind of as, as a jumping off point to think about the other spaces in their life. Um, well, I, I recognize that this, uh, this, what we've talked about today is only a small slice of, of what you do in your position at the Clem and Linda McGillicuddy's Humanities Center. Uh, how about you take us through that uh, center and its work and your role in it and some of the things that you're doing there. Yeah, uh, so I've been at the center a little more than a year now. Um, primarily, a lot of my work focuses on work with students. Uh, so on the right here, you'll see our newest cohort of fellows who um, we are working our way up. We started with just two fellows a few years ago, and we've been adding one more every semester. Um, they're on a rotating basis, so we have now four new fellows coming in every semester, and they receive $4,000 a semester to do the independent research of their devising. It doesn't have to be their senior thesis, it doesn't have to be something related to a class. Um, so this is really our way to engage not just humanities scholars within literature and languages and, and journalism and history and philosophy, but, you know, to, there's engineering scholars out there, you know, that I'm sure are just dying to do an art project. Uh, so this is our way to kind of showcase the strength of the humanities on campus, um, but to give students that freedom to really do research on anything that they would like. You know, so much of, of college is, you know, write a paper on this topic or make sure that you include source X, Y, Z, and it needs to be formatted this way or that way. Um, and so this gives them the freedom to really, um, you know, a lot of these kids are considering grad school. And so I think this is just a great opportunity for them, but the financial help that it provides um, so that they don't have to have a second job or, you know, be stressing out that they can kind of truly focus on their studies. So that's a big part of what we do, but uh, we fund faculty research. Um, so I have Ann Knowles pictured here on the left is doing some um, groundbreaking, groundbreaking research that's recognized worldwide on the Holocaust. Um, we have annual an annual symposium that we put on this year, which is related to the story of climate change, but we have other regular events throughout the year, um, including some community events. And so Tim, I know you and I are both a fan of the Bean Supper and you were able <laughs> to join us a few times uh, for the bean suppers that we held. Uh, where where uh, Bill Horner gave his favorite beans uh, talk. 
He his did. Famous, his famous beans talk, or perhaps his infamous beans talk. Infamous beans talk. People still talk yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we're looking for outside of the box ways to engage the public with the humanities. And so something that is so just quintessentially main as a bean supper, to use that as an opportunity to talk about food, culture, colonization, the movement of people and ideas and gathering and family and community. So, um, you know, I think the public is inherently interested in the humanities, especially now, you know, during a pandemic, it not only helps us think critically about the world, um, but the strength of good journalism or the comfort you find in great art or a good movie or a good book. Or well, the depression you find in a, in a bad movie. I mean, <laughs> to, to be able to both better understand the world, but also escape from it, um, I think is such an important thing right now. And so we love to kind of do everything we can on campus to have that enthusiasm spread to the public, um, but really do all we can to support the scholars here on campus um, to showcase. I mean, I came from UNC, Duke, and Loyola, and I can honestly say that the scholars at UMaine are equally producing as strong scholarship as some of the top institutions. And so how do we, you know, how do we highlight this work at a school that is rightfully so known for some great work in the STEM fields? You know, how do we really highlight the, the great work also being done in the humanities and, and the power that that holds for society right now that's just as important as scientific discoveries. Well, I wanna invite our audience to uh, pose questions. If you're watching on Zoom, uh, use the uh, Q&A function. If you're looking on Facebook, put a comment in the, uh, in the box. And uh, while we're waiting for qu questions to appear, Karen, tell, can you tell me, what are you looking forward to in 2021 and your work with the Humanities Center? Well, we, I just got our new application of uh, fellows proposals in, and so we have to wait for our committee to get back to us, but um, I'm super excited about the potential of some of the research that these students are doing, um, really groundbreaking, interesting work. Uh, we you know, have pivoted to digital this semester largely, and so of course, I'm looking forward to meeting with people again and holding events in person and being able to um, you know, make it even within my own field to conferences and, and be able to you know, meet with um, former coworkers and other scholars doing research on, on similar things. And so, yeah, I'm missing the human contact right now, but uh, we have a lot of great things planned for the future. I think much of next year is gonna be focused on the public humanities and the applied humanities. What does a job in the humanities look like? Um, what is the, the financial benefit of supporting the humanities for a community? Um, well, uh, true confessions, I'm on the advisory board of the uh, Clem and Linda, Linda McGillicuddy Humanities Center. And, and I think you're right, the, the fellows, the, the humanities fellows at the University of Maine are just inspiring to, to listen to their presentations and to see how they're engaged. It's like sitting in the sunshine and I, it, will, it will cure what ails you uh, for this time. And I hope that we have opportunities to put them in front of uh, this audience because their work is, uh, is really inspiring. Yeah, I'll mention briefly, we have one student doing work on feminist fairy tales. Another one um, looking at uh, the Holocaust in Lithuania, a uh, fellow examining the Wabanaki studies law to implement more Wabanaki education into the classroom. And another looking at family lore and truth and identity. So I think there's some really interesting uh, work being done right now. Well, Karen, if uh, anyone has questions, you can put them into our Facebook Live page. Uh, later on, this will uh, be posted on our YouTube page. So there'll be opportunities to uh, ask questions, and I'm sure uh, we can get back to you with, uh, with answers. But uh, Karen, this has really been enlightening. It's been such a pleasure to work with you. Thank you for uh, preparing this for our audience. And uh, we'll look forward to having you back sometime when you can learn about your uh, 
other work? Because I know you've got a, a lot of irons in the fire. Yeah, four currently, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Karen, and to our audience, thanks very much. Next week, uh, at this time, uh, 4.30 Thursday, I'm going to be presenting the Norwood Cove object, a mysterious implement alleged to be a relic of the 1613 Saint Sauveur mission uh, on, on or near Mount Desert Island. It's a pretty, pretty interesting story. I think, I, I think you'll enjoy it. And I'll look forward to uh, seeing you all back here in a week. So Karen, thanks for being part of this. Thanks you did a great job. Me. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.